this is the birth of the skateboard, as handed down by legend. But the evolution of the skateboard began years earlier. In the first half of the 20th century, early descendants of the skateboard took the shape of scooters. Homespun contraptions made of 2x4 planks, metal roller skate wheels, and fruit crate handles for control. These sketchy designs laid the groundwork for what would become one of the most influential subcultures of the new millennium. Sometime in the five decade period, the crates came off and the skateboard was born. In the late 1950s, companies like Hunko and Roller Derby put the first mass produced skateboards into stores. In the 1960s, surf culture erupted and skateboarding became the thing to do when the waves were flat. Skateboarding design was taken from its aquatic roots and transplanted onto land. Skateboards of this time period reflect these surfing origins in shape, style, and design elements. Although popular, the true potential of the skateboard was still years away. In the late 1960s, skateboarding fell off the face of the earth. Skating was sent underground with only a few hardcore enthusiasts practicing the activity. Skateboarding would not see the light of day until the early 70s. The introduction of the urethane wheel changed forever the potential of the skateboard. Fueled by this urethane revolution, skateboarding exploded in the 1970s. Throughout the decade, innovations in skateboard design would happen at a breakneck pace. With the need for increased flex and the ability to withstand the pounding of the modern skateboarder, deck suppliers would experiment with different shapes, sizes, and compounds for their boards. In the 1970s, skateboarding would come into its own, no longer reliant on surfing to guide the way. During this time period, manufacturers would experiment with laminated maple veneer decks, the formula that would prove to be the ultimate combination of strength, flexibility, and low weight. Throughout the 1980s, board design would continue on this evolutionary path. Skateboards of every imaginable shape and size variation would be created. In the 1990s, skateboard design would reach a pinnacle, helping to push skateboarding further than anyone could ever imagine. Skateboarding has and forever will evolve. But since the early whispers of that 1970s revolution, there has been one constant, the wood. Sacarum, commonly known as hard maple, rock maple, and Canadian maple. Hard maple is the only wood known that can withstand the punishment delivered by the modern skateboarder. According to the U.S. Department of Forestry, the hard maple grows from Nova Scotia westward to Ontario, southward into Texas, east into Georgia, up the Appalachian Mountains into New England. But the trees we care about are here in the Great Lakes region of North America. All the wood for a pro-level skateboard comes out of the Great Lakes region, period. It doesn't come from anywhere else. The only other wood used for skateboard will be, you know, what is on a skateboard at Walmart or Kmart, and quite often, you know, that's mystery wood. Nobody really knows what it is. Hard maple has, has a lot of properties that are very important to the skateboard industry. It's elasticity, it's uh, density, it's shock-absorbing uh, properties. And what gives it those properties are the regions in which it grows. The Great Lakes make the growing seasons very short and very quick. So what happens in the summer, it gets real hot and humid, the, the trees really spurred up. And then the winter, it's really, really cold, so it densifies. So if you take a hard maple tree and you put it somewhere else, it doesn't mean you can't get it to grow. It just won't grow in the manner that's going to make it good for making a skateboard. With temperatures ranging from 40 degrees below zero to 100 degrees above and a relatively short growing season, hard maple soaks up water from humidity in the summer months and shoots up while freezing and densifying during the winter. This is the magic combination that makes hard maple the perfect material for skateboards. This maple's become the standard in skateboarding. People have tried to reinforce it 
add other raw materials into it to make it stronger. But the characteristic of maple and how it breathes and expands, it's never been able to been duplicated or made something better by other raw materials, and that's why it remains better today. <laughs> It's generally between uh, 40 and 80 years old. They can be as old as 100, 120 years old. Much beyond that, you exceeded the useful life of a maple tree. An 80-foot tree, only the bottom 20 feet or so are actually a veneer grade because it has the least branches in it. So the rest of the tree ends up becoming lumber for furniture. Hard maple in general is a material has a high tensile strength. It's not like what you would find in a 2x4 or a sheet of plywood. It's very hard, tough wood. You look at a skateboard when it smacks into a curb and it takes a lot of abuse. The hard maple is such a dense tree that these 12 foot sections of logs weigh in at nearly one ton a piece. But how tough is the maple? And better yet, how much force can a skateboard take? To figure this out, we came to Soul Technology, makers of Etnies, Emerica, and S Footwear. Here at the Soul Technology Institute, the biomechanics of skateboarding are studied. The first of its kind, STI, is a scientific research lab solely dedicated to the study of action sports. Primarily, STI is researching the abuse that a skateboarder's body takes, but we're going to use some of their tools to see how much abuse the wood takes. This is the force plate. You can think of a force plate as essentially as a big bathroom scale. And the advantage the force plate gives us is it tells us not only how much vertical force is being applied to his foot, but we're also getting three-dimensional moments so we can measure how much twisting force or torque that he's coming down on the plate with. And this is Ryan Sheckler. Ryan weighs in at 114 pounds. Let's see what happens. <laughs> skating an eight stair handrail and successfully landing tricks. He was averaging about six to 12 and a half times body weight. Ryan's heaviest weigh-in of the day was on this front side flip. And on that one, he averaged around 12 and a half times his body weight on that landing. So let's do the math. Sheckler weighed in at 114 pounds and on his heaviest landing came down with a force of 1,425 pounds, 12 and a half times his body weight. So the largest impact of force we've ever recorded here in the lab was from an individual who weighed 180 pounds. And what we found is he came down on the force plate with 22 times his body weight, which is roughly equivalent to about 4,000 pounds of force. Depending on how you use the body's natural shock absorbing system of hips and knees, the force you're coming down with, according to this example, can range from twice your body weight to 22 times your body weight. Back in the forest, the veneer quality logs are being tagged and sent off to the mill where their journey into becoming a skateboard truly begins. prior 
prior to the milling process. The logs are kept moist in the summer months to prevent drying and cracking. Trees are perishable, if you will. They can't stay on the shelf forever. Once cut down, they have a limited lifespan before they can be processed into good veneer. The rule is that most trees are probably harvested and then processed by our plant within eight to 10 weeks from the date of cut. First, the logs are cooked in large water vats at a temperature of 150 to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. The 10-foot logs are then sent into the mill for debarking and cutting. For skateboards, uh, predominantly it's in 34 to 35 inch cutting. We'll bring in 10 foot logs, we'll take three blocks out of that log. We'll bring it to our lathe and turn it into veneer. Set against a blade, the logs are spun down, creating the ribbon of veneer. Within minutes, the logs become hundreds of feet of material. But how many skateboards come from one tree? In order to find out, we brought along Paul Schmidt. As we look up at them, and they're all trees with leaves, they're all different. Every one of them is different. They've got different characteristics, the way that branches break off, the way they grow from the bottom. Paul began making skateboards at age 14. In constant pursuit to make the best possible product, Paul's craftsmanship has set the standard for the modern skateboard. Accomplishments that have earned him the title Professor Schmidt. So we're here to talk about how many skateboards actually come out of a tree. We looked at those three logs at the top of the line here, which we harvested in the forest previously. That volumetrically came equivalent to 150 skateboards this pile of wood here will make. Figuring that one tree equals 150 skateboards, and one truckload of veneer is enough to make 10,000 decks, which in turn equals approximately 66 trees. Great Lakes Veneer ships approximately 100,000 decks worth of veneer per month. 100,000 decks is 10 truckloads of veneer, which is equal to 660 trees. Annually, this would equal out to 1,200,000 decks per year, which would bring us to a grand total of 7,920 trees. How many trees are actually harvested a year? It's, the numbers are, would be staggering. It's in the billions of board feet that we, we cut every year, but there's that much growth going on also. Taking this tree, which is obviously healthy, it's robust, and, and favoring something like that, it's, it's had a major injury. You can see it at that bend. It doesn't have as nice a crown. It doesn't have the position in the canopy. It's not a dominant tree. So by taking that and leaving that and saying, there is our quality, all we're doing is we're short sticking the landowner and we're short sticking the stand because we're taking quality genetics and leaving garbage. And that's our, that's our goal is to not do that. Instead of allowing the stand to die naturally, you know, it's going to take 10 years to do that. And the time it does that, it's going to further stress out its neighbors. We're going to come and try and relieve the stress so that if we do have a drought or an insect attack of some sort, the trees have the strength to repel it. You know, and as everybody gets better educated, they're realizing the benefits of managing their forest and, and what it can give back to them. Great Lakes Veneer uses environmentally conscious logging practices, but unfortunately, unscrupulous logging companies still exist. Using sustainable forestry techniques is essential and is an issue that the logging industry, as well as the skateboard industry, needs to vigilantly address. At Great Lakes Veneer, nothing is wasted. The scraps of wood left over from the milling process are burned cleanly at an extremely high heat. The steam is used to heat the factory, cook the logs prior to milling, and run the veneer dryers. Water is collected and recycled in the log yard. Environmental awareness is practiced throughout the factory, right down to the dyeing process. The aniline dyes used to impregnate the veneer are safe enough to discharge into most sewage systems. We do many things to promote the environment because the environment is what it keeps us in business. It's not only environmentally wise, it's socially and ethically wise. 
We're as environmentally conscious as we can be with the technology that's available, being that and doing that. Welcome to PS Sticks, where veneer becomes skateboard, where unparalleled craftsmanship meets streamlined production. All this for the sole purpose of designing and manufacturing a great skateboard. So welcome to PS Sticks. Come on in. We're going to show you how a skateboard gets made. PS Sticks handles the production for Element, Black Label, Pop War, Stereo, Alien Habitat. One of the unique things about the skateboard deck is that it's made of organic raw material. The average skateboard has a wood from three to five different trees in it, depends how it was processed. Because we have a mix from different trees, and trees are like people, there aren't two the same, so that part's never going to be consistent. Oh, each skateboard's definitely one of a kind. I mean, every person you know in this world's one of a kind. So the skateboard, the same thing. It's a product of the environment as it is the raw material group, but also as it gets used and applied. As you use it as a skateboarder, you don't use it exactly the same. You don't bash it into the same curve. You don't fly off the same ramp. So it starts with graphics and planning. Ultimately, the physical process starts with pressing the skateboard together. With that graphics and planning comes the type of construction, colors of veneer, thicknesses, all the parameters that are engineered for that product. The skateboard then sits in our climate controlled room for a week and stabilizes. And during that time, the moisture goes out of the glue, into the wood, and into the air. When it's ready to be cut after a week or longer, it comes into the machining department here, where we put it on a drill press. And we drill the holes in a stack of five skateboards. And we take that stack of five skateboards, we put it on a shaper, and it cuts all the excess out. So we put rectangles on, and we pull skateboards off. Then get set on the conveyor. They get carried on to the next station where they take a router and they round the edges round. Then it continues on to the edge sander. Well, the edge sander will edge sand the skateboard. He actually spends two and a half, three minutes with that skateboard. He's the one that touches it the most because his hands are checking as the rail round. Does that feel good? Am I happy with that? If you watch the production process of the skateboard, it's amazing to see how many times the skateboard is picked up, processed, inspected, and put down. Every time somebody picks it up, they're paying attention to make sure the quality of the skateboard is maintained, and it can be the best possible skateboard it can be. The skateboard will then go through our sanding machine where it will sand the uh, surface of it smooth, get all the dust out of the pores of the wood. Then it goes into the paint booth and it gets a top coat put on it. Then the skateboard will go on to printing. And that can happen either by heat transfer printing the graphic onto the skateboard or by direct screen printing. It just depends on the design of the graphic and what it will take to produce what the customer wants. And then eventually that skateboard gets bundled up in a bundle, gets sent out to the brand that we're building it for, that we designed it with and they distribute it out to the skate shops around the world. The PS Sticks factory turns out over a half million decks a year, but as the worldwide growth of skateboarding has occurred, so has the demand to stay competitive in the global market. My whole life I've produced skateboards here in the United States. The cost of doing business is expensive here. So we have built a second factory in China, and we produce skateboards there with North American hard maple. The factory in China has all the identical processes and procedures that we have here. 
We build all the molds, the templates, and the tooling here, and all they do is produce it there. Everything happens design-wise here by skateboarders, and they do the production there. So here at PS Sticks, a couple years ago, before starting our factory in China, we started to inscribe on the skateboards the country of origin, along with the serial number. That serial number lets us track when the skateboard was made and all the parameters about it. We can tell what the temperature was that day, what the humidity was the day they painted it, did it pass this test. So that number means a lot to us. We did that because we wanted clarity on what was made in the United States and what was not. The skateboard we make in China is almost as good as the skateboard we make here, but not quite. And that's because of processing the raw materials over there, that they don't have the technology to do as good of a job at turning the logs into veneer. Whether it's a skateboard born in the United States, or in China, or in your own backyard, once glued, sanded, and sealed, the wood takes on a life with no boundaries. You're your limiting factor on a skateboard. That fluidity of I'm moving and I'm an individual doing what I want is just absolutely amazing. Skateboarding is never the same thing over and over, ever. Because you're in control of your body, you're in control of your board, your board's an extension of your body using the environment that you're in. Bruce Lee had said that there's balance in motion, and I, and I truly believe that. The essence of skateboarding is, is motion and turning. You're sidewalk surfing. You're riding on a bike, but you still have all this gear and all the <laughs> propelling you, and the same in a car. Skateboarding, you're almost out of You've got like a little piece of wood and some wheels, and you. Skateboarding at its core is a very simple activity. You roll along on four wheels and a piece of wood. But the life of a skateboard is much more complex than the beautiful, seemingly simplistic act itself. Skateboarding has grown to an immense scale. Meet Board Track. Board Track is a, we're a marketing firm and we specialize in research for the action sports industry. Uh, mainly we study participants in board sports. Based on the way we collect our data, we figure um, this year, or the last year, 2004, that the, the skateboard mark was about $5.2 billion. The image of skateboarders as not being mainstream is something that's a little bit of the pa in the past, I, I think. With skate parks sprouting up all over the place, you know, it's pretty, I think it could replace baseball. I saw on a on a bus shelter in San Francisco a couple of years ago there was a there was an ad for you know I think it was called Extreme Consulting Services or something to this effect. But I mean this is you know straight ahead 
consulting services, as far as I could tell, but I mean, they just, they just wanted to pick up on this imagery to sort of um, sell their product. I mean, so, you know, you have consulting services and mutual funds for sort of, you know, picking up this, this imagery. It, it suggests to me that it's integrated into our culture in a much sort of deeper way than, than people, you know, realize, I think. Current figures suggest that there are 11 million skateboarders in the United States. Compound that worldwide, and that's a lot of people affected by a piece of wood. The skateboard, once delegated to the bowels of cities and derelict backyard pools, now has the power to influence the world around it. Skateboarding has just really made me who I am and makes you really an independent person. I've forged friendships around the world just because of a piece of wood with you know, four wheels and two trucks on it. It's interesting how it teaches you in life to be extremely tenacious, to endure. With traditional sports, you have to be good. There is a bar that you have to be measured by. You have to make that free throw. You have to make that home run. You know, with skateboarding, you don't have to do anything but whatever satisfies your own soul. And that's part of the reason why, you know, it's starting to get a lot of public support, too, I think, actually, is that people are looking at it and thinking that this is, you know, teaches kids to be individualistic and everything, which is something that's, that's more and more valued just in American culture, generally. I've read articles that say that skaters are, like, 70% more likely to be on top of technology and how to use it than non-skaters. Kate Martin. Skate mom. Excuse me for one second, would you? Gentlemen. Kate has witnessed the auspicious power of the wood firsthand. When the kids took up skateboarding, they were still playing coach sports, although they were on the wane because they, they're, they're athletic, but they, those things weren't like really doing it for them. And I kind of watched them diligently, almost compulsively practice and I was very impressed by that and then I became involved in the activist um, community. A landscape architect, Kate, has taken on the city of Seattle and turned her front yard into a skate park. Like, what are front yards for, really? Like, what are they for? I, I knew my infractions were very minor because I knew that play areas and front yards are legal and I know that it's legal to put ramps up for handicap and I had a permit for those curb cuts and so I said, you know do that and then when I did it and they came they were having a hard time figure out what part of this was not allowable. You never had anyone come by and say anything other than right on. You know, you're this is exactly what kids need. I've had more more men tell me that if they had had something like a skate park to use up their energy and creativity that they probably wouldn't have gotten involved in some things they got involved in. So really, the skate parks could be considered free by what you prevent societally, yet they won't build them. And let the and, get, and they'll be pushed around by somebody who actually doesn't understand at all what's going on with skateboarding. And Kate's front yard is an example of how a skateboard can redefine a space. But every day, skateboarders around the globe make use of urban spaces in ways never before envisioned. But once a lot of different things came into play, once the ollie came into play, you know, that changed everything. You can get up things and you can get off of things and over things, you know, before that you couldn't. And so therefore, I think you started seeing, you know, the landscape differently. For sure. And I think the more, you know, city planners and stuff and designers go about it trying to stop skateboarding, they're, they're going to end up creating more stuff to skate. It's like finding something new that wasn't made for skateboarding sometimes is even more interesting than skating something that was made for skateboarding. I'm going to talk to city councils about getting a skate park built. You know, I'm like, you know, ask a council member, can you be creative with a parking curb? Because I know tons of kids know how to be creative with a parking curb, you know, and they look and go, how could you possibly ever be creative with a parking curb? That's what skateboarding is. It's just an outlet to creativity. So kids become creative of all kinds of things. At one time, handrails had nothing to do with skateboarding. They're a staple of it now. When kids first started coming in and sort of seeing, you know, just a set of objects that could be used 
uh, for skateboarding. It, it was a redefining of that space, and it was you know inherently a creative act. And skateboarding really changes the, what it what it means, what, depending on where you do it, right? If you're in a skate park, you know, I mean, you, to to a certain extent, I mean, as far as the city is concerned, in any case, you are you know like a kid on the baseball diamond. If you think about skateboarding in sort of a downtown plaza where it's not welcome, then it definitely is sort of a challenge to, to codes of public space. And, and I think the MACBA, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Barcelona, is really interesting. In the MACBA, you know, you can't really say that it's a challenge to anything there because it's, it's permitted. And in fact, they use images of skateboarding in their marketing material. And in Philadelphia, that, that's another interesting case, the Love Park case. When Reagan completely eviscerated the, the social safety net in the 80s, the urban public spaces really had to take up you know, the slack. And in the late 80s and early 90s, skaters started using it. And then it, and it really got to a head when they, when they decided to, to ban it. And when they, the power structure in the city came to defend the skaters, and, and you know why was that? I mean, basically that they were gentrifying the space and they were serving to make it a safer space for other people and they were injecting um, you know, skateboard industry capital into this space. It's hard to say that it was really a challenge to public space. Maybe it was at one point, but it sort of became, you know, used as this instrument of gentrification. And then in, in Barcelona, it's it's integrated into um, the city's tourist strategy. I mean, here, if you go skateboard in the, the Bank of America plaza, I mean, then you can legitimately say that you're sort of redefining and challenging the, the definition of that space. In the quest to stop the skateboard from attacking public spaces, a unique byproduct has come about. The skate block. An industry that's sole purpose is to stop a skateboard. I just think, you know, it's it's the entrepreneurial spirit of America. I mean that's what this world this this country's built on is is trying to figure out your dream, you know, gaining some amount of capital, right? Now maybe in his mind I think he's doing he thinks he's doing good, some sort of good deed, like I'm stopping those pesky skaters from ruining my you know, that bench that the fat tourists who just bought their gap clothes want to sit on down at Fisherman's Wharf. You're like, oh, yeah, cool. Like, that makes skateboarding seem really huge, that it actually needs a guy to come and, like, figure out ways to put an end to it, you know? That guy is Steve Mace. Uh, I'm constantly amazed that somehow I've become uh, this, this expert in how to try to detour skaters from a particular spot. You know, who, who knew that was going to happen? Mr. Mace is the president of Raven's Forge. His products span from coast to coast, deterring skateboarders across the country. We make a, uh, a line of cast metal uh, products that look uh, something like this, this particular one we call a teardrop flat bar. Our goal is to edge where skaters like to grind. The skaters can, can skate down any kind of flat surface. They can do that anywhere, sidewalks or the top of a planter. But what seems to attract them to a particular spot is the ability to jump up, grind along the edge, make a good landing, and impress the friends. So we've tried to design a line of products that take away that edge on almost any kind of architectural detail. I have two partners, and we all work for, for a property management company, a client that we managed property for, who came to one of my partners and said, you've got to do something about the problems with skaters. So he went and sat spent a whole day and just sat and watched skaters. Kids would come, they'd skate, he'd hide in his car, they'd take off, he'd run over, take measurements, make notes, draw pictures, they'd come back, he'd jump back in his car and hide again, and came up with the idea of just putting something along that edge. We made him as a, almost like a hobby, well it took off. Now we don't manage real estate anymore and we sell a lot of skate blocks and um, it beats working. I mean, the, the purpose of my guess is to sort of deter vandalism, but I mean, it's a form of vandalism itself. The federal building banks in San Francisco, they're really nice banks, and they've got just all these brackets all over. It looks like somebody shot a staple gun on them. This is called a sidewall bar. We actually first designed it for the uh, Federal Plaza down in San Francisco. It's designed to go on the top of a planter or on a, a slanted wall. Everyone sort of opposed to it. Architects don't like them either, you know. I can't pretend to uh, say I think our, our products are beautiful. They're not. But I think they do what they're supposed to do, and most importantly, they don't, they don't overwhelm the architecture that's supposed to be there. 
cities are reluctant to stop skating where it shouldn't happen when they're not giving kids some place to go and skate. So when they build the skate park, they don't feel guilty when they turn around and start putting skate blocks up, you know, on city property, other places where to, to discourage the, the skaters from where they don't want. I think there should be as many skate parks as there are any other kind of, of athletic field. People are using skate parks. They should respond to that need and build as many as the community needs. The skate park serves a great purpose. It provides access to skateboarding to those who might not otherwise have it. The skate park also serves as a training ground to entry-level skaters. But the wood cannot be confined to a skate park. It's in the nature of a skateboarder to search out the new to skate the unskatable. The vehicle of the skateboard takes you on the path less traveled, and along this path, a new interpretation of the world around you is revealed. skateboarding so no matter where you look at it who's televising it it's still skateboarding and you can still go out there and be a skateboarder and express yourself and show the masses what you feel is skateboarding the skateboard for me was a way to get away from my parents uh, divorce at the time and to go explore the city I was too young to drive a car it was like an independent vehicle to get around through skateboarding I've been invited into the houses for dinner in like rough neighborhoods in Brooklyn you know, where I would never have ended up, you know. And then also in, like, just these mansions on the hilltops <laughs> where I would never have ended up. I don't think it's strange that, like, as skateboarders grow up, they become musicians and artists and these other, like, independent, self-driven activities. It's like, you kind of just got to be motivated to go down that road and, you know, take those kind of risks. And, like, I, I don't know, I think skateboarding kind of primes you for that sort of I mean, there was a whole scene created from that, from that anti-sort of establishment sort of attitude. Ah, I'm going to cut my pants up or whatever, just to, and for a shock value, to tell people, tell people you don't care, you know, bleach your hair and do all this wild or just, you know, to offend. It was like, because I don't want to be part of your world. It's about like, screw everybody, man. Like, this is what I do. This is how I do it. And I don't care what you think.
And on a less mainstream, more, like, retarded extreme level, I guess there's, like, the way it influenced snowboarding and rollerblading. Like, as much as snowboarding and rollerblading want to claim their independence as these, like, other extreme sports, they need to bow down because the names of all their tricks and the basis of everything they do is based off of skateboarding, you know what I mean? Like, it's another way that it's, like, lent itself into these other subcultures, I guess. It just opens, you know what I mean? So from this kid that... Um, just lives in this suburban area of Cleveland and surrounded by other kids that are just closed in their little worlds and all of a sudden I felt like I was like just exposed like to this huge bigger picture that nobody in my neighborhood could even comprehend you know what I mean you really felt like you're really a part of something super cool you know young kids especially they're searching searching for something that says this is me that's you know this is kind of an outward way of saying that. Oh, yes. The graphics have a way, I mean, it's a way of both, it goes kind of in hand with the creative thing. A lot of people took the graphics to heart more than just a simple uh, silkscreen job. It gave you a way of defining yourself, defining where you were. Um, for me, it was, it was all, I, all I wanted to do was draw skateboard graphics. Plus that's good. There's a certain there's a certain embodiment that it has. Uh, so many people, um, when they see an old board that they once had, it just brings back all these memories, everything, just the time period. And it's uh, with that with the book. A lot of people when they look at it, it's just it's it's really overwhelming for them. Just to also to remember, like I had that board, I had that board, I was doing this then. This is I was, oh I got busted there. Like it's so they have they have this. Psychic life, I guess. I'm 38. How many people my age can relate to an eight-year-old? Very few. But it's what you have in common is skateboarding. Regardless if you're skating, you know, a ramp or if you're skating a block or whatever you're skating, you still have something in common, which is pretty cool. And I and I hope to think that it's more of a brotherhood, you know, and understanding that when you first started skating, I mean, you were the black sheep, you were the outcast, and that's why you started skating, you know, because it was an independent thing. You were a loner, and that's what you did. But then you see other people and you have some sort of common ground and bond. Skateboarding can be a solitary revelry or a shared experience among friends. It can be a backlash to authority or something you do when you have some time to kill. Whatever the reason, the wood binds generations of skateboarders around the world. This is the circle right here. This is These are the guys. We're always together. We have a great time. We spend a lot of quality time with our kids, which is the most overwhelming thing for me out of, out of all of this. This is why I did this, to have these people around me, because they make my eyes tear up. <laughs> these are great people. This is the Cerna clan a group of family and friends bound together by the wood. Three generations who find common ground through the skateboard. This guy lives for skating. That's what he is. Skateboard. He'll sit there with his spoon and ride his spoon and his cereal bowl. Everything that he looks at, it has a skateboard in it. But it's cool, that's because of his pops, you know, dad skating with us, and it's been down through the generations, and that's what we do, that's how we get our joy, having our boys learn how to skate, being out there with us, mom coming out, you know, us doing big barbecues, going camping, Eric, the whole thing, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's The only thing that gives me more joy than my skateboarding is to see my kids excel to do good in school, to do good at skating, to do good in life overall. And um, I think we all thrive for that. Each and every person who rides a skateboard has his own experience with it. The skateboard is whatever you want it to be. And the life of a skateboard is as varied as the interpretations of the wood itself. Describe this object for me. Describe this object. <laughs> uh, 
That's 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 interesting. <laughs> this is called a skateboard. Skateboard. Blank deck. Yet to be filled with life. Functional. It's a deck. I know what it is. Made of wood. Skateboard that's been made with hard maple. It's got five plies running the length of the board and two plies running across the board. Some holes drilled for your trucks. It's blank. I mean, there's not, it's not branded at all. This is the life blur right here. I don't see it any different than a baseball mitt, a soccer ball, a bat, a basketball. Curvaceous. My first love. To hate it. Also, it's a way to go sort of interact with the environment around you. I can derive so much fun out of something like this. Flip it. Flip it the other way. That would hold promise. It could be your meal ticket to get over to Europe to go skateboard. A vehicle, first and foremost, yeah. And just looking at it, you go, yeah. This is where it all starts. This is where it all ends. Shredding time. Whoa. Whoa. Can a skateboard die? I think it's got to be alive first, you know? Well, no, it's just an inanimate object, man. It ends up stored in your basement or on someone's wall or in a landfill. The birth and life of a skateboard probably starts out the same, but then it's a matter of what kind of kid winds up with it. I killed it <laughs> for my enjoyment. There's so many ways it can go. Is a skateboard ever really dead? You know, people turn them into art. They, they are definitely memories. The best thing in life to have is a memory. And if you've got a skateboard, there are memories that go with that skateboard. So did it die? It's in your thoughts, even if you went to the garbage dump? No. whether a skateboard lives or dies, but there's no doubt that the wood creates memories and unspoken bonds between those who ride. These bonds are strong enough to bring some to collect the very object that generates these memories. The Skate Lab Skate Park and Museum in Simi Valley, California, houses the largest known collection of skateboards. Around the world, skateboard art shows are regularly held. Books, films, and installations chronicling the legacy of the wood are released increasingly more. But it's this intangible desire for the memory spawned by the wood that is the root for so many collectors. The collection. I have 287 boards and they're all, it's, it's every board that I have ever ridden since my first brand new board. This Caballero, right here. because it's like my parents bought it for me, one, and two, it's like, hey, I don't know if I want to throw a, a board away. And then before I knew it, I had a little stack going. And then I realized, like, I'm really deep into this and realizing how when I look back at my boards, it conjures up memories, you know? So then I was just so deep into it, I just kept saving them and saving them. And now this is what I do. I just, I save every single board I ride. This was the first brand new board I ever got. My parents bought this for me. Christmas 1988, Steve Caballero, Powell Peralta. The, the best way I can describe them is they're my, they're my substitute for photographs. Big Brother interview. The first time I ever went to California, rode that in Australia. This is the evil board in Paris, Germany, Cleveland. <laughs> I, I look at a board and I just immediately zoom back to that time, you know? These are my early years in, in 
these mean the most to me, probably. They're not trophies or anything like that. They're just uh, markers in my life, I guess. These were all my amateur days skating for Black Label. As soon as I picked that board up, you know, my mind just gets flooded with all the memories of that tour, you know, like everything about it, you know, and I don't really have that many photos, you know, but I have that board. A sample of my pro model right here. And when I turned pro, I was just going to take an already existing shape to be my board. And Paul Schmidt is the guy that makes black label boards, and he convinced me, you know, to come down to the shop. And, you know, he was like, hey, Christian, you know, like, come down. Like, let's, let's, you know, fool around and try some shapes and, you know, find something you really like. So I think he wanted me to ride these boards and give them back to him and tell him what I thought, but I kept them, obviously. And then this was it. This was the first finished, finished one. First pro model right there. Does the childhood dream come true right there? Sometimes, like if I did tricks that meant something to me or whatever, I'd write that on there. But this was a it was a pretty big trick, I guess, at the time, at least for me. And it was a big 50/50 grind I did on this huge humble ledge down at UCSD. This is a really important to me. Some people know this footage a long time ago. There's a, a Hubble ledge up in Hollywood. And Fountain and Vine is the, the cross streets. And a long time ago, I was doing some tricks on it, and I fell, and I, I knocked out my two front teeth. Years later, 2004, I went back. I did a frontside blunt down that ledge. So... I mean, for me personally, it was a really cool because I had lost my teeth on that same ledge years ago and never went back. So, so that's a that's a good one. Hang on to them and hopefully, you know, maybe pass them down. Maybe I'll have kids one day, pass them down to them and whatever, and <laughs> let them burn them. <laughs> it's a little insane. It's a little obsessive, you know, but. Uh, you know, I don't know. It's like, I've been doing it for 17 years, and I'm so deep into it, it's like I can't stop. Uh, hopefully, you know, when a kid gets a new board, or when I get a new board, or even when I look at these old ones, or hopefully if other people look at their old boards, or they're looking at my old boards, it, it puts life into them. You know what I mean? It somehow inspires them for whatever, and gives them life to, to do whatever. Some collect for the memory the wood supplies, others see the maple as muse. Decks become the canvas of painters. Some remove the object of the skateboard far from its original form. And some transform the deck long before it hits the streets. It's become cool for art shows in the last couple of years for people to send out shoes or send out skateboards or send out toilet seats and like everybody paint on this thing and send it back and we'll have a show of painted toilet seats. It actually started because uh, I got invited to be in this art show in Portland a couple years ago. Paul Schmidt sponsored this show and sent out these boards and on the top of the board that I was supposed to paint it said like, you know, handcrafted by Paul Schmidt. And I was like, well, that's pretty crazy. Like, I'm the one that's got to paint this thing. So I was like, just to kind of have fun with it, I, like, cut the board all crazy and, like, painted it. And uh, when I was done, I was like, well, that's actually pretty rad. Like, what I started to do is just kind of a funny, like, take a nudge at Paul Schmidt for putting his name on the board that I have to paint. Uh, actually turned out to be a cool idea. It was a great way to recycle all these boards. And uh, people have a nostalgic thing about skateboards anyway, and as far as collecting them and hanging them up. I'm not treating it as like a skateboard-based art form. I mean, yeah, it's a cut-out skateboard, and I painted on it. But it could as well just be a random piece of wood. I'm using skateboards because it kind of ties into what I do for a living. Also, just because I like the idea of saving them and giving them a new life. And just, But the themes and the, and the stories and the things that are on it have nothing to do with skateboarding, you know? I've sold them to random-ass people that know nothing about skateboarding that just thought it was a neat-looking thing. Part of it is uh, pretty sacred, and at the same time, part of it's just like recycling a piece of wood and putting a character on it and finding a new home. Even though the object of a skateboard, used and ridden, can be cherished, the wood itself is still just that, 
wood. And some people find use in the utilitarian value of the wood to extend the life of a skateboard. Well, I started working in a skate shop uh, in Boise, Idaho. The very first piece that I made was an exchange for uh, a small you know, closet full of skateboard decks. Uh, so this bench was actually one of the first pieces that I made uh, just out of necessity at the time. When it snapped, usually it just becomes waste, so I guess it is a way of sort of preserving it. Um, you know, I don't paint over any of the skateboards, I don't try and cover anything up. I want people to be able to look at it, to be able to see how each deck was used. But a skateboard really isn't all that expensive, um, so it's a lot more disposable to people. But, uh, you know, if you have any sort of progression in skateboarding or any sort of advancement, then, you know, it should be something that is really important to you or that, you know, you want to work with, keep around. Um, but a lot of it's also just a way to make the skateboard usable again, to keep it around for a while and, and have people still be able to enjoy it. And, you know, even people that don't skateboard, um, one of the pieces is in a grocery store. Uh, they have all this nice furniture that's surrounding it, and then there's this armchair that's out of skateboards and in uh, a really you know pretty high-end community pretty wealthy community um, where skateboarding is totally frowned upon in all the streets all the way around it and suddenly here's this piece and so it's you know bringing attention to skateboarding that way i've always thought of uh, you break a skateboard and it's it's dead it's no good you know if it's cracked it's dangerous if it's snapped it's totally shot um, and I think that there are a lot of people, uh, people that are painting on skateboards or making the furniture, that it um, is sort of an extension of that, of that lifespan. Skateboarders are very creative people in general because that's part of the attraction, do what I want. You know, I don't have to be good, I just have to have fun. I think it's just like, you are skating, but it somehow can, at least for me, has connected me to something way more. It influences every everything, the way I think about life, my, my uh, tendency to want to be completely independent from everything. It definitely gave me a lot of confidence that I, may, I might not have had otherwise to, to go and sort of try things and sort of, you know, in other areas of life to sort of figure that if I really sort of put my mind to something, I could actually do it. And I don't know that I would have found that otherwise. This simple piece of wood transcends borders, redefines the boundaries of the world we live in, and generates memories that will live on long after the material decomposes. But in the end, the skateboard provides most of all an anchor for friends to gather around in the quest for good times. And I've never even heard that song.